For many teenage girls, the prospect of their first boyfriend is an exciting time in their journey to finding themselves. A time of tender affection and butterflies in your tummy, knowing that someone special loves and cares for you, choosing you above all the other girls in school. And for 17-year-old Ellie Gold, this was no different. She'd recently started dating fellow classmate Thomas Griffiths, who she had a crush on for the longest time. She'd known him since the seventh grade and had always been infatuated with him. So when they finally got to make their relationship official, Ellie was over the moon. But as is often the case with teenage love, particularly the first one, its fervor can fade as swiftly as it bloomed. Only three months into dating Thomas, Ellie decided to end things. She realized that she wasn't ready for a serious relationship and wanted to focus more on her schoolwork and the upcoming exams. She knew that Thomas would most likely be heartbroken, but she hoped that they could remain friends, and she was certain that he would get over the breakup fairly quickly. She didn't notice any red flags, and she definitely didn't expect what would happen next. The following morning, Ellie stayed home from school. She didn't have any classes that morning, so her parents allowed her to stay home and revise for the upcoming exams. Thomas thought that he was going to see Ellie at school that morning, and he was planning on calling her for a chat so that they could discuss the breakup the previous evening, most likely hoping that she would have changed her mind and agree to give the relationship another chance. When he realized that Ellie wasn't at school that morning, he walked to a nearby bus station at 8.30 a.m. and took a bus back home. After he got to his house, he then took the family's car and drove to the home of Ellie Gold. Two hours later, Ellie was dead. Thomas Griffiths had strangled her until she became unconscious and then took a knife from her kitchen and stabbed her in the neck a total of 13 times. He then proceeded to clean up the scene and then stage it to look as though it was a suicide. Ellie Gold was born on February 6, 2002, and lived in Conn, a small town in Wiltshire located in the southwest of England. She was a fun-loving girl, who came from a stable family, had a close-knit group of friends, and she was someone who had a bright future ahead of her. In 2019, she was 17 years old and studying towards her A-levels in school. She was already preparing for the next phase of her life and had big dreams and aspirations for her future. She was planning on enrolling in university the following year, where her plan was to study psychology. She also had a passion for horse riding and animals in general, and even toyed with the idea of joining the mounted police just so that she could work with horses. Ellie was also someone who any parent would be proud of. In addition to her friendly nature and approachable personality, she was also a hardworking and responsible young lady who embodied the qualities of diligence and responsibility. She had a clear vision for her future and would do everything in her power to achieve her goals. She knew her responsibilities well and her parents could rest easy knowing that she embraced her academic obligations and they never had to worry if she was studying for exams or if her homework was completed. In early 2019, just as Ellie turned 17, she informed her parents that a boy at school had asked her out and that they'd started dating. His name was Thomas Griffiths, and he was also an A-level student at Ellie's school. She'd known him since the seventh grade and had always had a crush on him, so she was pretty ecstatic when they finally made it official. He came from a stable family and also seemed to have a bright future ahead of him. He was a rugby player for the school's first team and also a prefect at his school. He was actually Ellie's very first boyfriend, and although her parents would have preferred for her to focus on her schooling and not worry about boys, they also knew that teenage love was something delicate and something they needed to manage. They told Ellie that they would allow her to date, but that they wanted to meet Thomas. So they invited him over for dinner to get to know him a bit better. As they sat in the kitchen having dinner that evening, Ellie's parents kept a close eye on Thomas, trying to get a gauge of his character. Although there weren't any obvious red flags, her parents had noted that he was very quiet and didn't talk much. They attributed it to his age and the nerves of meeting Ellie's family, but deep down, doubts lingered. Her parents were certain that the relationship between Ellie and Thomas wouldn't last long. They found the two of them to be incompatible and didn't think it would work out. They obviously didn't tell Ellie about this, as they wanted her to make up her mind for herself. So they gave Thomas a chance, but knew deep down that the relationship would eventually fizzle out. She came home from school, oh, mum, a boy's asked me out. And I said, oh, that's nice. Do you know him? How do you know him? Oh, well, yeah. um, he's friends of some of the boys. 
um, I wouldn't have paired him with Ellie. No. I'd say that. I, they, they were, to me, just seemed like a, a mismatch. I didn't, couldn't see where, what she found fun about him or no. you know, why, why she wanted to be with him. Um, so that was, that was odd to me, but I just thought it would run its course. Three months into dating Thomas, signs started showing that Ellie was becoming frustrated with their relationship. She grew tired of having to see him every day and never having any time for herself. He wanted to be around her 24-7 and would get grumpy if she wanted to spend any time with her friends. Ellie also wanted to focus on her A-levels, but found it hard to balance her life with the unrealistic expectations Thomas placed on her. She realized that she wasn't ready for a serious relationship, yet Thomas was already starting to talk about marriage. In the beginning of May 2019, Ellie told her mom that she was going to break up with Thomas. Not exactly shocked by the news, her mom asked her if anything happened and if she wanted to talk. Ellie assured her mom that nothing happened and that she just wanted to be single, so she told her mom not to worry and that she had everything under control. Ellie then went to her room and broke up with Thomas via text message. During the text conversations, Thomas kept denying the breakup, telling Ellie that he loved her and that they belonged together. But Ellie had made up her mind and stood firm in her decision. That evening, she asked her parents if she could stay home the following morning because she didn't have any classes scheduled until the afternoon. She thought that she could use the time to revise for her upcoming exams before heading to school in the afternoon to attend history class. Her parents agreed and Ellie arranged with one of her closest friends to pick her up the following morning at 11 a.m. so that they could journey to school together. The following morning was May 3, 2019. Thomas walked into the school cafeteria and asked Ellie's friends if they'd seen her. He'd been looking for her the entire morning, as he wanted to discuss the breakup they had the previous evening. When Thomas heard that Ellie wasn't in school that morning, he wasted no time in trying to find her. He told one of the teachers that he wasn't feeling well, so he walked to the bus station nearby and took a bus back home. When he got to his house, he immediately changed his clothes. He put on a black hoodie and also took off his white sneakers, and opted for his black ones. But just as he was about to leave the house, his mother arrived home. It seemed that she had come to pick up something. Thomas didn't want his mother to know that he skipped school, so he hid inside one of his cupboards and stayed there until she left. The minute she left, Thomas got out of the cupboard and took the keys to the family's spare car and set off towards Ellie's home, about a 10-minute drive away. When he got to Ellie's house, he knocked on her front door and told her that he wanted to speak to her. The two allegedly spoke in the kitchen, and an argument soon broke out after Thomas realized that Ellie was serious about the breakup. At some point during the argument, he started strangling Ellie, who was desperately fighting for her life, hitting and scratching Thomas, hoping he would let go. Thomas wasn't letting go, though, and continued to strangle Ellie until she passed out. He then went to grab a knife from the kitchen drawer and repeatedly stabbed Ellie in her neck, a total of 13 times. After he realized that she was dead, he took the knife out of her neck and went to wash it in the basin, making sure that he washed off his fingerprints. He then placed the knife back into Ellie's neck and placed her hand over the knife to make it look as though the wounds were self-inflicted. Thomas then proceeded to clean the crime scene before unlocking Ellie's phone and texting her friend pretending to be Ellie. He told the friend that she was no longer coming to school and that the friend didn't need to pick her up, ensuring that Ellie's body wouldn't be found until at least the afternoon. He then realized that Ellie had left scratch marks on his face and neck, so he set out to create an alibi for himself. He wrote a message in the group chat he had with friends, telling them that he was going through a difficult time due to the breakup and that he was scratching himself in an attempt at self-harm. After he posted the message to the group, he then sent a few messages to Ellie's phone, asking if they could meet up and talk about their relationship. At 3 p.m. that afternoon, Ellie's dad had come home from work, so I pull up in the drive, um, Ellie's car, um, a small red car that she was learning to drive in was on the drive. Um, so I come into the house, walk into the kitchen, um, put my phone and wallet down on the table. And then from the corner of my eye, I see Ellie's legs. Um, so I immediately rung for an ambulance um, and yeah, um, they tried to tell me how to resuscitate her. Um, 
and I told them that it was pointless. I believe she was dead. Um, yeah, it was, it was horrific. When police examined the scene, they quickly realized that this was no suicide and that foul play was involved. They told Ellie's parents that they were investigating a murder before telling them that the killer was often someone known to the victim. They then asked her parents if they knew of anyone who would hurt Ellie, and the only name they could come up with was that of Thomas Griffiths. Police went to Thomas's house to question him about Ellie Gold. They immediately noticed the fresh scratch marks on his face. Thomas denied having anything to do with Ellie's murder, but police knew that there was more to the story. They took a look at his family's Wi-Fi router settings and realized that Thomas's phone disconnected from the home's Wi-Fi network shortly after he arrived home from school that morning. His phone remained disconnected from the network for a few hours, before it reconnected after 12 p.m. They suspected that this was the time that Ellie was murdered, so they looked at surveillance footage of the area around Ellie's home. At 11.56 CCTV from a passing bus caught a silver Ford Fiesta leaving the area where Ellie lived. The vehicle registration number was pretty clear on the footage, and police were able to trace it back to the vehicle belonging to the Griffiths family. With no other member of the family being home during that time, it was clear that it could only have been Thomas behind the wheel. Thomas Griffiths, however, continued to deny his involvement in the murder and denied being at the scene of the crime. Police then took a second look at the family's Wi-Fi router and realized that Thomas's phone connected to the home network after 12 p.m. before disconnecting for an 18-minute period. Police then looked at the area surrounding Thomas's house and realized that there was a wooded area nearby. So police walked out of his front door and timed themselves walking for exactly nine minutes towards the wooded area. As soon as they hit the nine-minute mark, they stopped and started looking around. They very quickly found a black bin liner and inside they found blood-stained napkins, cloths, and towels, which would later be confirmed to contain Ellie's DNA. A search of Thomas's room also produced a pair of black sneakers found to contain Ellie's blood on them. With the evidence stacked against Thomas, he was arrested and charged with the murder of Ellie Gold. In August 2019, Thomas Griffiths informed the court that he intended to plead guilty to murder. He told the court that he went to Ellie's home on the morning of May 2, 2019, he said that an argument broke out and that he blacked out after that, and that he couldn't remember what happened next. The state pointed out that although blind rage can make you forget things, in their opinion it was clear that Thomas had planned everything carefully. He left school and went to change clothes first. He cleaned up the scene and tried to make it look like a suicide. He texted Ellie's friend to ensure that she wasn't found, and he even tried to dispose of the evidence and create an alibi for himself. In November 2019, the Bristol Crown Court sentenced Thomas Griffiths to life in prison with the possibility of parole after 12 years. The court mentioned his age as a mitigating circumstance, as the law in Britain doesn't allow for whole life terms for offenders under the age of 18. The court also said that due to the fact that Thomas didn't bring a weapon to the scene, and instead made use of a knife from the Gold household, they weren't convinced that it was premeditated murder. Thomas Griffiths will become eligible for parole in 2031. He will be 29 years old, 